Greetings, my fellow Elmontians, and welcome back to Broadcast from the Bunker. Uh, today's hot topic is going to be metamorphic rocks, rocks that uh, undergo uh, changes due to heat and pressure. Um, but anyway, uh, take a look up at the screen here. Uh, there is a sedimentary castle quiz posted. Uh, be sure to get it done uh, by 11 o'clock tonight. Uh, it will close out. If there are some network issues, don't worry. I uh, will certainly monitor that situation. Uh, as far as questions, uh, you can certainly use uh, the YouTube comment section if you want to post uh, group questions. I'll get back to you right away. Or if you want a more uh, private question, of course, you can use your Remind app and uh, ask any question you like on there. All right. Today's do now is numbers 9 to 12 in your GC. All right. So give them some love and... Uh, Report back to me uh, in a few minutes. Okay. Okay, so we're back. Hopefully you spent some time on that. Let's take a look at what we got. Alright, first one here in the Northern Hemisphere. During which season does the Earth reach its greatest distance from the Sun? Uh, remember on this one, it's kind of opposite of what we think, right? In the summer here in the Northern Hemisphere, we're actually further from the Sun. We call that aphelion, right? A for away. And in the winter in the Northern Hemisphere, we're actually closer to the sun. I know that sounds backwards, right? If you're closer, you'd think it'd be warmer. But remember, the Earth's tilt is what's really causing those uh, seasonal temperature changes. So if you take a look at this one, uh, greatest distance from the sun, that must be A for away, aphelion. And that would be when we are in summer. Okay, moving on to number 10 here. Uh, on December 21st, at which latitude would an observer find the sun directly overhead? Well, December 21st, if you recall, that's the winter solstice, right? And the latitude the sun is directly overhead on the winter solstice is the Tropic of Capricorn, which is 23 and a half degrees south. So, uh, finding it directly overhead right there, 23 and a half degrees south, and why don't you pencil in there that that's the Tropic of Capricorn. All right, for number 11 here, Uh, how would a three-hour time exposure photographs of stars in the sky appear if the Earth did not rotate? Well, remember, if the Earth did not rotate, then the stars would appear fixed in the sky, right? The reason we get those star trails, the reason the sun rises and sets, the reason the moon rises and sets is all because of the Earth's uh, rotation. And, of course, that's 15 degrees per hour. But if the Earth did not rotate then you wouldn't get that motion across the sky, so you'd have to go with the one where it looks like there's no motion uh, whatsoever. You'd have to go with choice D. Okay. And number 12 here. Uh, which is the best indication that the moon's distance from the Earth varies? Well, remember... Uh, they call that apparent diameter, and if something is further, it looks smaller, and if something is closer, it looks bigger. And uh, that happens because of an elliptical orbit. All right, If the orbits were perfectly circular, then the distance between objects would stay relatively constant, but once you have an ellipse, you get that oval shape, and you change the distance, and that, of course, changes the apparent size or apparent diameter. So... Uh, best indication that the moon's distance from the Earth varies 
it's got to be a change in uh, the size of how it looks. So a change in the apparent diameter of the moon. Right, option C there. Okay. Again, any questions on that, uh, you know, you can leave them down in the YouTube comment section or uh, the Remind app. It's up to you. Uh, probably be beneficial if you put them in YouTube. This way, other students that have the same question can get the response. All right, let's jump into the uh, GC. Uh, the title for today's lesson is Metamorphic Rock Formation. All right, meet me there. Okay, and uh, metamorphic rocks are uh, actually, uh, they're beautiful rocks. They can form from any other type of rock, right? They're uh, from heat and pressure, like we said. Uh, it's a change in form um, from a lot of stresses and heat and pressure. Um, all right, so let's get rolling in it. Uh, you can see they have beautiful textures. They call that banding. Uh, you can see the, uh, the lines there. That's not to be confused with sedimentary layers. Those are bands from being squeezed. Okay, it's just a cute little video of uh, showing you a change, right, a metamorphosis. Check it out. Right, so there's a good little analogy for you, metamorphism, right? Not much heat and pressure there, but still a change in form. And that's what the word metamorphic means, change in form. All right. So check out on the left, oh, on the left side here, uh, you have a classic granite. Granite, as you remember, is a very common igneous rock. But if you squeeze it, right, put a lot of heat and pressure on it, uh, you end up with a rock called gneiss or gneiss. And uh, you can totally see how it's changed, right? The, uh, these bands here, they call them foliations, uh, resulted from this heat and pressure, and it makes the minerals kind of uh, recrystallize and move in the rock. Now, it doesn't melt the rock, but it uh, allows them to move, grow, recrystallize. They get shinier. They get these gorgeous textures, uh, and that's a metamorphic uh, niece, okay? Uh, which brings upon the joke of the day. Uh, so they sometimes call these foliation, they call that banding, right? So see if you can get the joke of the day here.
All right, so here it is. Why are metamorphic rocks called the music rocks? Take a second on that. Think that one. Think that one. There's a little clue right there. Anybody? That's right, folks. They have bands. Get it? Music. Bands. Bands make music. <laughs> I tell you. Anyway, yeah, so we call them music rocks. They have these gorgeous bands. Uh, I've never heard music come out of them, but... Uh, just a good little play on words for you there. Okay, uh, this is the rock cycle from your reference tables. And if you'll recall, we started at magma, right? Magma cooled, crystallized into igneous. Uh, the slower it uh, cooled, the bigger the crystals got. And ultimately, those rocks would break down by weathering and erosion into sediments. Uh, the sediments, of course, if they get buried, deposited, can become cemented into sedimentary rock. Uh, and then from here, either the igneous or the sedimentary rock can undergo heat and pressure and turn into metamorphic rock, right? The words up here, metamorphism. Another word you might see is recrystallization uh, to form metamorphic rocks. Please take a minute to read that through. All right, pause the video and read that through. A little background information for you. All right, metamorphism changes... Uh, what is changed with the original parent rock that forms into a new rock by heat and or pressure. Okay? Uh, and there are certain characteristics that result from this. If you take a look on the bottom uh, right here, uh, you'll see that's a granite and it's getting squeezed. Well, we said granite turns into gneiss. Uh, so watch carefully. Kind of a slow motion transition here. All right? There it goes, recrystallizing. Now, of course, that's intense heat and pressure, and you start to see those bands, those foliations, and it turns into gneiss. Look at the simulation on the left here showing what's happening to the crystals. They're totally getting aligned. You get that mineral alignment. It can result in what's called foliation, and if it gets distorted, we call it banding. Okay, just another view for you. All random crystals that get uh, lined up in... Uh, what we call foliation. All right, so it causes lots of neat things, uh, alignment of minerals, uh, there could be the folding of the minerals with intense heat and pressure. Uh, you get recrystallization, the crystals will grow larger, the rocks often become shinier because bigger crystals reflect more light, they're very, very pretty rocks. Um, and of course, when you're squeezing something, you're gonna increase the density as well. So a lot of characteristics change and it makes uh, certain metamorphic rocks very good for building purposes because they are very, very, very tough rocks. All right. Uh, and now a brief word from our sponsor. Just a uh, little background uh, video. Uh, it gives you some good visuals here. Check it out. It takes great forces to raise rock out of the sea, bend the layers, and tilt them, and make them into mountaintops. These same geologic forces also work deep in the crust. There, great heat and pressure break and realign the atoms of the mineral crystals. This creates a new structure, a new mineral. The result is a rock like this. It may once have been an igneous or a sedimentary rock. And then, deep within the earth and at great temperatures, pressures were exerted on the rock like this. The bands that we see here are the new minerals that formed under that great heat and pressure. We can see that this rock has alternating bands of white minerals and dark colored minerals. We can see that the bands in this rock are not nearly as uniform in color or thickness as the layers we saw in the sedimentary rocks. This rock is called gneiss. Nice. It's part of a larger class of rocks called the metamorphic rocks. Metamorphic means changed form, and we can see why. Hundreds of millions of years ago, it may have been like the granite we visited earlier, or like the layered sandstone, but it was changed under great heat and pressure into a very different kind of rock. I know what you're thinking. No, no, that's not my dad, but uh, just another uh, fellow earth scientist. Okay. Uh, so Mount Everest, you know, it's the tallest uh, mountain on earth, over five miles high, uh, but even more amazing, uh, being up that high, you wouldn't think you'd be able to find uh, marine fossils. That's right, folks, marine fossils, fossils of ancient fish, 
uh, marine life on the top of Mount Everest, five miles above the ocean's surface. Uh, that's truly amazing. Well, how in the world does that happen? Uh, well, you got to think about how it was formed, okay? Uh, when Mount Everest was formed, you have two tectonic plates coming together, and when they hit, they converge, they had to go up. And whatever was on top of them at the time got pushed up with it. Uh, and here, if you take a look at this diagram, that's India, and here's China. Uh, the two of them would converge together over time, and up, 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 the material goes. And uh, as a result, you end up with um, these marine fossils at the top of Mount Everest. Okay, It's called regional metamorphism, and it occurs during mountain building or plate movement. Okay, the parent rock is the original rock, right? It, maybe it was a granite, let's say. Uh, it will become stressed and turn into a metamorphic rock, such as Nice, and that's what that is on the right side there. Okay? So, pretty wild stuff. India, again, would converge into China, would lift it up, uh, and even today you can find those marine fossils five miles up in the air. Okay? This next chart kind of gives you an idea of a continuum of what's happening. Uh, so you could start out with the material clay, right? You all played with it as kids. Uh, it makes mud. That's great. But when it dries out, it turns into the sedimentary rock shale. Now, shale is very soft. You can preserve a lot of fossils in it. But if you squeeze shale, if you put a little bit of heat and pressure on it, well, it metamorphoses. And the first thing it turns into uh, is going to be a slate. Slate is uh, used as a roofing material in some places, uh, some walkways. Uh, it's a pretty tough rock. It's a lot tougher than uh, shale was. But you can also re-metamorphose a metamorphic rock. So if you keep putting heat and pressure on slate, all right, you're going to make the rock phyllite. Uh, you're still recrystallizing. The rock is gradually getting shinier. And notice uh, it's getting a little deeper in the earth, and the temperatures are getting a little hotter and that's what keeps metamorphosing it. Well, you guessed it. You can keep going. And if you metamorphose phyllite, you're going to make a rock called schist. All right. Uh, schist is very, very, very shiny. Uh, and its parent rock was phyllite, but now it's schist. And you can take it one more step. You can uh, put a little more heat and pressure on this one and turn it into that classic gneiss we just saw before. Any more than heat and pressure than that, you're going to start to melt it, turn it back to igneous. So uh, think of uh, nice as as nice as it gets, right? So play on uh, pronunciation there. Here's your uh, metamorphic chart. I'll show you what it looks like in chart form. So as you go down, there's more heat and pressure. Uh, so you'll start out with shale, and the shale turns into slate. A little more heat and pressure, slate turns into phyllite. A little more heat and pressure, phyllite turns into schist. A little more heat and pressure turns into nice, but that's it. You cannot go below that black line there, folks. That's the end of the road. You turn into magma, and the cycle starts all over. So, again, nice is as nice as it gets. Okay? This is showing you some gradual changes. The slate to phyllite, the phyllite to schist, the schist to nice, uh, in picture form of what the rocks actually look like. Look at the size of the crystals here, gradually getting bigger. They're all lined up. They're foliated. And there, all of a sudden, they're very thick. You'll start to get your banding in the niece. Okay? Uh, one last clip I'll show you. Uh, I don't know if you're, there are any Indiana Jones fans out there. Uh, the other type of metamorphism, aside from getting squeezed between tectonic plates, is called contact metamorphism. And there's no, uh, no extreme pressure, but there's extreme heat. And that's what this scene tries to show you here. Check it out. And there it is. His hand was contact metamorphosed. I don't know if you saw that movie, but uh, they got a lot of information off of that uh, scarred hand there from contact metamorphism.
Okay. So here's how contact metamorphism works. On the bottom, you have a magma chamber under lots of pressure. It rises, uh, and whatever that magma touches, it metamorphoses. It becomes contact metamorphosed, and you make a different type of metamorphic rock. Okay? The process is called contact metamorphism. Uh, the magma touches surrounding rocks and changes it into metamorphic rock. And here you have a picture of sandstone, which is sedimentary, and when touched by magma or lava, becomes a quartzite, a metamorphic rock. Okay, uh, mostly heat, uh, not much pressure involved, so it's called contact metamorphism. You don't get foliation, you don't get banding, you don't get those beautiful wavy lines. You do get a shinier, harder rock, however. All right. Little computer picture of how it looks. There's the grains of sandstone kind of loosely cemented together, and there's quartzite, which is now much more, uh, uh, the crystals grew much bigger, it's much more compact. Okay, uh, the chart once again, uh, if you look this way, this one doesn't go down this time, it goes across. So uh, sedimentary coal, bituminous, turns into anthracitic coal. You go to the right. Uh, the next one here, sandstone. Well, touch it with lava or magma, turns into quartzite. Uh, limestone or dolostone. Well, touch it with lava or magma, turns to marble. And same thing is true for conglomerate. It turns into what's called a metaconglomerate. So you don't go down this part of the chart. You go across. Okay, they're all metamorphic rocks, but they form in different ways. All right. Uh, one last thing I'd like you to add on this chart here, it is possible for not only schist to become nice, but like we said, also granite to become nice. So please add that into your reference tables chart. Heat and pressure on granite will also turn it straight to nice. All right. Uh, here's a little summary. Please uh, hit pause at this point. Uh, take a few minutes. Try to figure this out on your own. We'll start out with number one, the types of metamorphism that occurs at F. Well, if you take a look, these little uh, lines here, I know they look like hatcher lines from the mapping unit, but this time they're telling us contact metamorphism occurred. Lava touched them. So this is the symbol for a sedimentary rock called limestone. That's in your sedimentary tables. And if you contact metamorphize it, uh, then you're going to make a rock called, you guessed it, good old marble. Okay, uh, I think, actually I'm jumping out of order here. Uh, so yeah, that's contact metamorphism. The second one, identify where another, uh, where another letter where metamorphism is occurring. Well, certainly E, you're getting contact metamorphism as well. Uh, number three, identify the metamorphic rock that forms at letters F and E. Well, like we said, that's going to make a marble there. And E was a sandstone, so sandstone that gets touched by lava or magma becomes quartzite. All right, uh, on the bottom here, identify the type of metamorphism occurring at positions one and two. Well, one, you're getting touched by magma, so you guessed it, contact. And for two, you're getting squeezed, squeezed between two tectonic plates, so that is regional metamorphism. All right, here's a chart. Again, please hit pause, take a minute, try to figure this out on your own. Sometimes you have to go from the parent rock to metamorphic, and other times you got to go from the metamorphic rock back to the parent. All right, take a minute. All right, for the first one, if you need the tables, I put them right next to the slide in the GC. Shale, uh, if you take a look, shale, metamorphic shale becomes slate. Okay, so you would have slate there. Granite, all right, on your tables should become nice. All right, uh, marble, if you go backwards now, right, marble is metamorphic, you gotta go backwards. That could have come from either limestone or dolostone. Uh, I'll put these answers up in a second so you can check it. Conglomerate would become metaconglomerate. Quartzite, you gotta go backwards, started from a sandstone. And bituminous coal, you got to go forwards, becomes anthrocyte or an anthracitic coal. All right, you can flow through your chart again. This is all in your GC. Hopefully, you're following me on that. There's the answers to the chart. Double check your work. Again, hit pause, please, as often as you need to. All right. 
Uh, this is a different type of chart, so identify each rock type. A is talking about weathering and erosion, deposition, compaction. Hopefully that sounds uh, a little sedimentary to you. Okay. Uh, B, melting followed by cooling and solidification. Well, hopefully that sounds a little igneous to you. And C, heat and pressure. Uh, hopefully that sounds metamorphic to you. Okay. A couple of Regents questions. Again, hit pause, take a few minutes. All right, number one here, which characteristic of rocks tends to increase as the rocks are metamorphosed? Well, you're not going to get more fossils, right? That's for sure. Fossils are delicate. Uh, we said that as you squeeze things, they become closer together. They become denser. So they'll often become denser rocks. Uh, what is the main difference between metamorphic rock and other types of rocks? Well, if you want to do process of elimination, uh, it says uh, they contain only one mineral. Well, that's not true. Rocks often contain more than one mineral. They call that polymineralic. Uh, An organic composition. Again, metamorphic rocks can come from any rock. Uh, banding, there's that key word, right? That looks pretty good. Um, and again, this last one here is just talking about uh, silicates. And again, that could be uh, lots of different rocks. So yeah, you got to go with choice three, uh, banding. The third one here, metamorphic rocks form as a direct result of, well, we said heat and pressure. Uh, we said um, contact with magma or lava. So the one that seems to look the best, certainly not melting. That's a sedimentary process, right? Precipitation, evaporation, erosion, and deposition. That's sedimentary as well. So, yeah, you got to go with heat and pressure on that one. Last one here. Which diagram represents a sample of Nice? Nice, remember, has those gorgeous bands in it, those wavy lines. So, certainly diagram three. Okay. So, I hope you uh, followed along with that. I hope it made sense to you. Uh, if you were confused on a couple things, please go back and, uh, you know, check, uh, check your work once again. Don't forget to finish that sedimentary quiz. It's online uh, by 11 o'clock tonight. Um, and I'll meet you back in broadcast from the bunker next time. Take care.